Okay. Good morning, everyone. Let's stand together, please. You are my shepherd who cares for me. happen through you and according to your will. For your hand upon us through the storms of this last week, through the recovery, and for the wonderful opportunity to come up with the 23rd Psalm and just to sing your praises this morning, that all things happen through you. You are the heart and soul of us, and you have given us life and life with purpose, life in Christ. May we praise your name this morning. As we come to your table, may we remember those gifts that did give us life, your gift. And as we hear from your word, Lord, may we grow stronger, that we may be your hands and your feet in our community. We thank you for struggles that come along our way, that sometimes tests our faith and our resolve, and we come through them because of you, Holy Spirit in our presence, in our lives, that gives us that strength to 
know that we are sons and daughters of the living God and brothers and sisters in Christ and that all things work together for the good of us and anybody who are called according to your purpose. May your name be praised in all things. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, we have another video here. Would you like to uh, sit down? We'll watch that. Hello, my name is Jonathan Smith, and I've been a missionary for well over 40 years, mostly in Latin America, mostly in Mexico. But the Lord has had me here in Colorado Springs now for nearly 14 or 15 years, uh, serving mainly with the navigators at their headquarters at Glen Erie. Um, most of my work over the years has been dedicated to young people, although that also implies working with adults so that they will raise young people properly according to the Word of God. Uh, a couple of passages that have always meant a lot to me and mean even more so now that I'm well into my 60s. One is seven, Psalm 71, verses 17 and 18. And it says this, O God, thou hast taught me from my youth, and I still declare thy wondrous deeds. And even when I am old and gray, O God, do not forsake me until I declare thy strength to this generation, thy power to all who are to come. Clearly, the psalmist equates not being able to share God with the next generation as being rejected by God, and I feel very keenly to that myself. I, I am grateful that God allows me to continue to work actively with the young people around me and literally in many other countries as well, as well as teaching other people how to raise their own children or the children in their church or community so that they will too rise up and love God and follow him and serve him. Another verse is Psalm 78, verse 4, and it says this, We will not conceal them from their children, but we will tell to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wondrous works which he, which he has done. So I do a lot of premarital counseling, using the word of God as a foundation, a lot of marital counseling, counseling as well. Uh, primarily discipleship, but it all revolves around basically answering three questions. First of all, why do we exist? The Bible is very clear. We exist for one purpose and one alone, and that is to glorify God. But the second point is disastrous. We have lost our very ability to glorify God because of our sin. Isaiah 64, 6 makes it clear that even our best efforts at glorifying God are worthless rags, filthy rags. So the third point that we focus in as we begin our discipleship, premarital counseling, whatever it might be, is why then did Jesus come? Why did God the Father send his Son to die on the cross for our sins? And the answer is, again, very clear from the Word of God, starting with Ephesians chapter 1, that God sent his Son Jesus to die for our sins so that we can once again glorify God. Salvation is all about God receiving the glory that he deserves not about our benefit nearly as much as the glory of God. And uh, once we answer those three questions biblically, we can then embark on life. How do we glorify God? How do we know if we're walking in God's will? And those are just some of the things that daily I am uh, sharing, both with young people as well, as well as with parents and with future parents that are just getting ready to get married. Uh, it's a thrill and a joy. Uh, I believe without a doubt that when we begin raising our children for the glory of God, that our nation will once again turn around and follow God and live for his glory. Thank you very much. Lord bless you for all you do for his glory. Amen. Please remember on September 10th, it's going to be our Mission Sunday here at Paley Christian Church. And several of these, we're, we're kind of showing everybody about 14 of the programs that we support here through our congregation. And uh, it's going to be a great, great roundup and, and a way of fellowshipping and, and meeting some of the ones that are going to be here with us. Hey, let's stand up together. How many uh, people woke up when the storm hit last Sunday night? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we did. Uh, it was amazing that I was able to, you know, get Gail downstairs and stuff. And, and then I know... For whatever, uh, some of us had lots of damage, some of us had little to none, but our community, in a sense, had, had the damage, didn't we? But like I was saying earlier, 
my faith is good. My faith never wavered, and it was uh, just tested a little bit on that. All praise to God who reigns above. We're going to sing that together. Here we go. All praise to God who reigns above. Are we on the wrong song? Yes, yes we are. <laughs> back, back up a little bit. Right before in the secret. Hey, here we go. No, no, no. Can I help, can I help you? Praise to God who reigns above. We we got the right shirt on. We're just not communicating it. <laughs> uh, That's it. Okay, <laughs> yeah. you're right. All right. Who's then that? we'll come back to the other one. Yeah. Who put that back there? It, it's fun because uh, cause two of the songs we sing start out with exactly the same words, and that's what happened. All right. Is it in F? Yes. <laughs> All praise to God who reigns above.
and reaching to the highest goal. That I might receive the prize. Pressing onward, pushing every hindrance aside. As we come to this time of communion together today, I want to read one of my favorite passages of Scripture. It's found in Philippians, the second chapter. And beginning with the fifth verse, it says, Your relationship with one another should be the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he made himself nothing taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has exalted him and given him the highest place in the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. You know, one of the things that we ask ourselves sometimes is, why would God do that? Well, why would God leave heaven and come to earth to die such an agonizing death? And the answer is for us. Because every one of us here this morning has sinned. Every one of us here has made a mistake somewhere along the line. And the Bible says, and the wages of sin was death, but the free gift from God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's what we come at this communion time to celebrate. For the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse 25, for I received from the Lord that which I passed on to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body. It's broken for you. The same way he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat of the bread and drink of the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Father, as we come to this time now that we look back to that place called Calvary and remember that Jesus was you in the flesh and yet he laid down that eternal life on Calvary's cross, not for anything that he'd done, but for all the sins that we have committed. 
Father, he does deserve the name that's above every name. And we need to bow and worship him. Not just on that day he comes, but every day. For the blessing of eternal life and for the hope of salvation that we have through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now this morning, Father, as we partake of this loaf, may you bless it as we remember his body that was broken for us. And this cup, as we remember that it was his blood that was shed for our sins. And may all honor and glory and praise be his. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Son 
Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Would you pray with me? Oh, precious Heavenly Father, I pray that in this place your name will always be lifted up. For you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are our creator, our redeemer, our savior, and our God. And we come together today for no other reason than to praise you. And so we ask you to fill this place with your spirit today and draw near to our hearts and our lives. Touch us, Father. May we feel you close beside us. Speak to us through your word, Father, that we might walk this week one step closer to the way that you've called us to walk in Jesus. And Father, may our lives be an example to those around us in the world today of what you and you alone can do. For none of us could straighten our lives out. None of us could make things right but through Jesus Christ, Father, and through your spirit that lives in our hearts, we're completely transformed today. Transform us even more, we pray, and may you be glorified and lifted up in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, and the kids are dismissed to junior church at this time. If you have your Bibles, you might want to turn to the book of Colossians. Actually, you might want to have two fingers in your Bible today because we're going to do some jumping back and forth between Colossians and the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. Because I want to talk about, I want to talk about Christians in the workplace this morning. In Colossians 3 verse 22 it says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything. Now, you need to understand with this verse that slavery was a way of life in the Roman Empire. Slaves might be the guy who cut your hair. It might be the doctor who took care of you. It might be the man who tutored your kids. And what we call the working class today, they would have been slaves in that day. And slaves were considered to be second class citizens. So I want you to imagine with me what it was like for a slave to, to be in a worship service like this, they were probably sitting back in the back rows or, or, or sitting on the floor, and, and they're listening to this guy read this letter from 
Paul, and all of a sudden he reads slaves. And their ears perk up a bit. Did I hear that? Did, did he read that right? Is Paul really writing to us too? I, and this is the second mention of slaves in this letter. In Colossians 3 verse 11 it says, Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. But Christ is all and is in all. And they probably said, wow. Did you mean in Christ that we're all the same? In Christ that we are all equal? We're not considered second class citizens in heaven? And I'm sure when he read the word slave again, they were just holding their breath in anticipation. I mean, can't you just imagine a master and a slave sitting in the same room and they, they, they kind of glance at each other and wondering what Paul's going to say. And then the man up front reads, Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything. And it probably hit the slaves like a ton of bricks. I, I mean, doesn't Paul understand what our life is like? Doesn't Paul understand that this isn't fair and, and they're mad and they're hurt? And who does this guy Paul think he is anyway? He doesn't know me. Or my master. That, that guy works me 18 hours a day. And now Paul writes that I ought to obey him in everything. As a matter of fact, my master sold my son to another Roman from another city. And I've never seen him since. And now Paul's telling me i got to obey a man like that in everything. Now we may not be slaves today. But I honestly think that this passage might stick in our craw as well. Because sometimes there are principles that we have to apply in, in the Bible. And, and I think a universal principle that would go quite well with this passage of Scripture would be, employees, obey your earthly boss in everything. <laughs> and you're probably thinking, no way. Ain't going to happen. You don't know my boss. That's ridiculous. But I think we better tune in here for a minute for three reasons. First, because this is a command from the Bible. And, and folks, as much as we like to, you can't just slice and dice the scriptures to fit what you like or to say what you want it to say. And secondly, because this is really what's best for you. In the Old Testament, God said, I am the Lord, and I will teach you the way in which you should go. And if you obey me, your peace will be like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the ocean. And thirdly, because quite honestly, we're in better shape today than they were because at least we have a choice. A, a, a slave that was born a slave in that day had no choice, but we have the ability to choose who we want to work for and where we want to work. And so Paul says, okay, Obey your boss in everything. Now, now, what does Paul mean when he says, obey your boss in, in everything? Well, I think it's pretty simple. It means obey your boss in everything. <laughs> if you work for a company and they require you to wear a certain kind of uniform to work every day, you follow the rules. If the company you work for says that everybody in their company is required to work one Saturday a month, when your Saturday comes up, you do it without grumbling or complaining. Now, now there is one exception to this rule, though. If your boss should ask you to go against God, against something that's taught in, in the Scripture, then you need to take a stand for God. In the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had gone in and captured Jerusalem, and he took some of the people back to Babylon as slaves. And part of his thought was, I'm going to take the very best, the very smartest, <clears throat> and I'm going to train them to be good Babylonians, and then I'm going to have them serve in the king's court. And so in Daniel chapter 1, verse 5, we read this, the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. That's nice of him. 
They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they would enter the king's service. Now, here's the problem. At least for Daniel and his Jewish friends, the food that was eaten at the king's table was unclean. It was clean food that they were told not to eat. Today, we'd say it wasn't kosher. So look what it says in the 8th verse of chapter 1. But Daniel resolved, Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. And so if your boss asks you to doctor the books, to hide something, or, or, or to use lower grade materials and you know it's called for, or, or to exaggerate things about your product and so, so you can have more sales, and you think it's wrong, you shouldn't just go around complaining. You, you don't go behind their back. You, you, you go right to the source. Daniel went right to the man who was in charge and said, here's my problem. What do we do? Now, I want you to notice that at first it didn't work out too well. In verses 9 and 10, it says, Now God caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I I am afraid of my Lord the king." who assigned you food and drink. Why should you look worse than the other young men your age? The king would have my head because of you. His first reaction was to say no. I I know you want to do it your way, Daniel, but I've got to do it my way, and if if things don't work out right, I'm going to lose my head. So what's Daniel going to do now? Well, Daniel took into consideration what the man had told him, and what he wanted, and he, he, he tried to come up with a way that they could both get what they wanted. And so verses 12 through 14 says, he said, Please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance <coughs> with that of the young men who eat and drink the royal food. And treat your servants in accordance to what you see. And so he agreed to test them for 10 days. And the test went Daniel's way, hands down. In verses 15 and 16, it says, At the end of 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. And so the guard took away the choice food and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables and said, "I, I, I want you to catch something here. Daniel was respectable or respectful to those who were over him. When, when, when the guard first came to him and said, No, nah, Daniel, I can't do that because you might not look like the other guys and I'd lose my head. Daniel didn't stomp his feet. He didn't pout. He didn't go around whining. Why did I always get treated this way? Instead, he saw his boss's position. And he tried to come up with a plan that could Benefit them both at the same time. Now, now here's the problem. It doesn't always work that way, does it? Sometimes you're going to say, I don't want to do this, and they're going to say no, and and you're going to have to make a choice whether you're going to obey God or obey them. In Acts, the fourth chapter, the Bible says that the Sanhedrin, the court of that day, told Peter and John not to preach anymore about this guy named Jesus. In verses 19 and 20, it says, But Peter and John replied, Judge for yourself whether it's right in your sight, or right in God's sight, for us to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help but speak about what we have seen and heard. An occasion came up in Daniel's life like this too. In Daniel, the sixth chapter, the third verse says, Now Daniel had distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king, the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. The king was planning because Daniel was such a great administrator and worked so hard to making him the second in all the land. Now this didn't go over real good with other satraps and administrators. And so the Bible tells us in verses 4 through 8 of chapter 6, at this, the administrators and satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct in government affairs. 
but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said to themselves, we'll never find any basis for charges against Daniel unless it has something to do with the law of his God. I love that passage. I just wish I lived such a pure life that the people would look at me today and say, you know, he didn't do anything wrong that I know of. In fact, if we were going to have anything to use against him, it would have to deal with his God because he will never go against his God. So what do these guys do? They go to the king and they say, oh, King Darius, you are such a wonderful man. You are so powerful and you are so great. You know, we've noticed that the people in our kingdom pray to a lot of gods and I don't understand that. Because I don't really think the people need to pray to anybody but you, O oh king. I mean, as great as you are. As a matter of fact, maybe there ought to be a law that anybody who prays to anybody but you is going to get thrown into a lion's den. And the other administrators went to the king and they said, oh, that sounds great. You know, you deserve that. And Darius liked the idea. It sounded good. Why should anyone pray to anybody but him? And so... So he made the decree that for 30 days, anyone who prayed to any god but him would be thrown into the lion's den. And he signed it into the law of the Medes and the Persians that cannot be repealed. And Daniel's stuck. I mean, there's nobody to appeal to. Nowhere to turn. So what's he supposed to do? In Daniel 6, verse 10, it says, And when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to an upstairs room where the window opened toward Jerusalem, and three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Now, now I want you to know something here. Daniel was not blatant, okay? When, when the king made this decree, he didn't say, okay, king, I'll just kneel right down here and pray in front of you. Or, or he didn't do it in the middle of the, the, the square where everybody could see. No, he said, you know, there are ways I can do this. I'll just go home to my own room where there's nobody else around, and I can still pray to God. But, of course, these guys were watching. I mean, they were out to get Daniel. And they caught him. They turned him over to the king and the authorities. And they said, you know what the punishment is? He's, he's supposed to be thrown to the lions. Or, are you going to do what you said you were going to do? Because the law of the Medes and the Persians couldn't be changed. So at the end of the day, they threw Daniel to the lions. And maybe sometimes you feel like that. You ever feel like you've been thrown to the lions? You ever feel like you've been chewed up and spit out for standing up for what you know is right? If you have, then Daniel knows exactly how you feel. He's been there too. And in Daniel 6, verses 19 through 22, it says, At first light, the king hurried to the lion's den, and when he he was near the den, he called out to Daniel, I like this, in an anguished voice. Daniel, servant of the living God, has the God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions? (laughs) And Daniel answered, O king, live forever. My God sent his angels and shut the mouths of the lions. They've not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I done anything wrong before you, O king. When you put God first, God is able to pull off things that no man ever could. And I want you to see something here. This king, even though he'd throw Daniel to the lions, respected Daniel. As a matter of fact, before he threw Daniel to the lions, in, in, in Daniel 6 verse 14, it says, he was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to do so. He tried everything he could to keep him out. Then then the next morning at sunrise, he's at the lion's den going, Daniel, I hope 
that God you serve was able to save you. Later, the king throws all those who accused Daniel into the lion's den, and the lions were on them before they hit the floor. Which brings us back to Colossians 3, verse 22, where it says, Slaves, obey your masters in everything. Not only when their eyes are on you to win their favor, but with a sincere heart. I think what it means is if, if you are working a job you don't like, you don't drag your feet. You, you don't say, what's, what's, the, what's the least I can do and, and still get by? No, Daniel was respected because he gave us all. Daniel gave the very best he had in everything he did, even for a pagan king. And Paul writes to us and says, do what you do with sincerity. I had a friend who said when he was growing up he had a drug problem. Uh, maybe you know a kid like this or two. His parents drug him to church, and drug him to Sunday school, and drug him to Wednesday night service. But he said, you know what? But my dad did change my life forever. But folks, it shouldn't be that way. Parents shouldn't have to drag their kids to do what's right. And bosses shouldn't have to threaten people's jobs just to get them to do their job. Paul says you do what you do willingly. You do what you do sincerely. Why? Because Colossians 3.22 tells us That we're to do it with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. And then in 23 and 24 it says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. As working for the Lord and not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord that you're serving. This is why you can obey a, a boss that's unkind. Because you're not really obeying The boss, you're obeying God who tells you you need to obey. And you're actually serving God and not your boss. Do you understand that? That if you follow this principle, when you go to work tomorrow, you're not working for your boss. You're working for God. And if you're obeying your boss because it's what God commands, you're actually obeying God. You're not just obligated to your boss. And and you know what? That should make all the difference in the world. So so if you're busting tables or, or if you're selling business forms or if you're drilling teeth or if you're making mortgage loans, he says, do it like you're working for God and not the guy above you. And there are some benefits that come to a job when we look at it that way. The very first is, it's freedom over slavery. You know, there are a lot of people today who are slaves to their jobs. They they get up every morning hating it, but they go to work. They're they're, they're like a bird that we had for a while out by the back doors of the church. He, He would come every morning and he would stare at himself in the window of the church. And I think he got angry with that bird on the other side of the window because then he would fly into the window and smack up against it. And he would do that over and over and over again. And there are a lot of people who feel the same way about work. It's, it's like they're smashing their head into a wall. And they're not getting anywhere. And let's face it. It's a terrible place to be if you work 40 hours a week, 50 years a year. 50 weeks a year. That's 2,000 hours a year. And and if you work at that job till retirement, let's say 40 years later, that's 8,000, 80,000 miles. (laughs) Just wash my glasses. I can't do a thing with them. (laughs) That's 80,000 hours of your life, Okay. And God says, I don't want you to go through life feeling like a slave. Let me ask you, why do people do that? Why, why, why do people put so much of their life into something they honestly don't like? 
Can I be honest? Because I think this is important to understand and it ties right into our lesson this morning. You stay at the job you have because you feel like your job gives you significance. Like it gives you value. Like your meaning in life comes from your job. So your value will rise and fall by the work that you do. And and, and what people think of the work that you do. So if you get a raise, you feel good. If you don't get the promotion you feel like you deserve, you feel bad. If, If your boss chews you out, you feel even lower. And if you're top seller, then you're on top of the world. And if you get fired, well, then your life is over. And it's not just in the jobs we're paid to do either. Somebody out of the blue stops by your house to visit, and the place is a mess. And when they leave, you feel like the lowest of low because your self-esteem comes from everybody thinking that everything you have is is perfect. It's, it's always clean. You get a note from your child's teacher, and they say that, that there's a discipline problem in the classroom, and you're destroyed because you connect your value with how good a parent you are. And so if the kids misbehave, it reflects back on you. And that's wrong. That, that's slavery. Now, 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 those aren't bad things to have a clean house or kids that behave, but, but God wants us to get our significance from him and him alone. Because once you realize that's where the real significance comes from, then, then you're free to do all those other things without worrying that life may fall apart if something goes wrong. And that's true freedom. (coughs) But when you get your significance from things, you're on thin ice. Because when your significance comes from things, what happens when they take the things away? What happens when the company goes under? What happens when you get hurt and you can't work that job anymore? What happens when you're forced to retire? To get your significance from what you do, listen, is idolatry. It's putting something above God. And it's crazy. And it's wrong. Don't do it. See, serving God alone relieves all the stress. Because you know what, what, what causes us the greatest stress at work? Really, I think it's twofold. Number one is your boss's view of you, the, the fickleness of his position. And, and secondly, how successful you are in a fluctuating world. And the reason these things are so stressful is because, let's be honest, we have little or no control over either one of those. You can't control how your boss may feel or what might be going on in his life today that makes him feel the way he does. And and you can't control what's going to happen in the world tomorrow. You don't know what's around the corner. But when you put God on the throne of your life and accept him as your sole boss, you no longer need to be stressed by those things because God is a great boss. Did you realize that when God created Adam, he put him in a perfect work environment? The Garden of Eden. And the Bible says that that in the cool of the day that God would come and walk and talk with Adam and Eve in the garden. This is a good boss. Listen. Let me just ask this question. I know it's a little out of the blue, but but, but parents, if you give your child a gift, what is the greatest compliment that they can pay you? Isn't it to go out and use the gift 
and, and play with it and wear it out and join it. In fact, if it breaks, you, you just want to go out and get him another one. And the Bible says God created a whole world. And he looked at it and he said, it's very good. And he made it for you and I to enjoy. He doesn't want us to be stressed out all the time. But are you? God is a gracious, loving, compassionate boss that's promised that he'll never leave us or forsake us. So we don't need to live our lives stressed out every day doing something that makes us miserable. Your boss's opinion is going to go up and down. And so if you base your stress level on him, then yours is going to go up and down too. But God is always there. And if God is truly your boss, then your job is meaningful no matter what your job is. Now, let me give you a couple of reasons why that's true. First, because whatever's done for God will last for all eternity. You know, all those things we're chasing after here on this earth, the cars, the house, the cash, it's all gone someday. But if you're doing it for God, it lasts for all eternity. And secondly, because it makes our work each day a witness for Christ. Remember when King Darius came to the, put Daniel in the lion's den in, in Daniel chapter 6, verse 16, it says, The king said to Daniel, May the God whom you serve continually rescue you. I want you to notice that Darius has made a connection between Daniel and his God. Why is Daniel the way he is? Why is he the kind of leader he is? Because God, or Daniel serves his God continually, every day. And people will notice. I, I sometimes wonder how many people are going to be in heaven very simply because they worked around Christian people. And, and they saw the kind of language that they used and the kind of life that they lived and the kind of families that they had. And they said, you know what? That's what I want for my life too. Do people where you work see a difference in you? Because thirdly, our, our attitude at work can change the attitudes of people around us. Many people go to a job they don't like every day. But you can change that. If you walked in every day with a smile on your face and you were willing to go the extra mile and, and, and when they needed a hand, you, you didn't worry about the fact that they were going to get credit instead of you and, and you gave them the extra half. After, all the, after a while, they'd say, you know, my job's not all that bad. But the final reason is because we can praise God and glorify him no matter where we are. I heard a story about a bus driver that used to take flashcards on his bus with him. When he'd pull up to a, a red light, he'd, he'd get one out and he'd look at it. And he had verses on it. And he said he, said he member, memorized 50 verses of Scripture every year while sitting at red lights. How many of us can say we've memorized 50 Scriptures a year ever? <laughs> Einstein began working in a patent office and later in life he said he was thankful for that first job because it gave him time to let his mind imagine what could be. No matter what your job is, you can focus on God and make it more meaningful. I, I, I love the story coming from Kentucky 
about the two shoe, shoe salesmen, maybe you heard it, who were sent to the Appalachian region of Kentucky to sell shoes. Two guys from the same company. The, the day after they got there, the one wired back to his boss and said, nobody wears shoes here. Send money so I can come home. The other wired, no one wears shoes here. Send 5,000 pair pronto. If you have a positive, confident attitude in God, you will be successful. But it's not always immediate. See, that's the problem. We want it done right now. But, but, but do you realize that it took Adam or Abraham and Sarah 30 years before Isaac came along? 30 years. You know, we all talk about Joseph and what a, a, a wonderful prime minister of, of Egypt he made. Do you remember that there were 17 years of slavery in prison before God made him the prime minister? And David, David was anointed the next king of Israel by Samuel, but it was 20 years before Saul died and David could become king. It's not going to happen overnight. But understand this, if you stand with God, ultimately, Paul says the judgment's coming. Colossians 3 verse 25 says, Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong. For there is no favoritism. I don't know or care who you are this morning. If, if you're not walking with God on judgment day, God doesn't show his favoritism. But the Bible also says in Isaiah 40 verse 31, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They'll mount up on wings like eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not faint. But that comes through trusting in God and not trusting in ourselves. Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived. And, and let me give you some advice from him found in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. You know, the biggest problem we got, we're trying to run our own life. <laughs> and we don't know how to run it right. But, but, but here's what God says. I want to come in and help you run your life. I, I, I want to come in and be a part of your life. I want to come in and forgive those mistakes in your life. I want to come in and give you a life worth living. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a pretty good deal to me. <laughs> but we have to accept the deal. We have to, to, to say, you know what? I've messed this life up on my own. I'm not good enough. I'll never be good enough. You're right, you won't. But that's okay, because Jesus already paid the price for you. And so today, if you're sitting here and, and, and you've been miserable at work all of your life, and, and you just hate the thought of even tomorrow morning coming when you have to go into work, God can change all that. If you let him. But until he comes into your life, until you change bosses and start listening to him and following him, it's, it's not going to change. That's why we want to offer this invitation this morning. Maybe, maybe you've never accepted Jesus. as you. Hi, I'm Gary Swick, and I'd like to thank you for listening to the message this morning at Paoli Christian Church. We hope that what you've heard has touched your heart and encouraged you in your walk with God. We would really like to hear from you if you have any spiritual needs that we might help you with. You can contact us by looking for us online at paolichristianchurch.org or by phone at 812-723-2664. Paoli Christian Church is located at 1700 West Hospital Road in Paoli, Indiana. Once more, thank you for listening and 
I hope that you'll listen again next Sunday as we worship God together at Paoli Christian Church.